and we are live to the Enterprise Brand Media Video Blowout. What are brands getting wrong? And who better to ask than Paul Greenberg and Brent Leary of CRM Players and Players Production Network fame? How you doing? <laughs> well, again, other than the word fame, I we're doing fine. <laughs> we're doing, I think we're doing good. So for those of you watching on um, on LinkedIn in particular, can you comment just so I know the comments are coming through? Thank you for that. I'm sure as you join us, I will see that. Um, what these guys don't know is they're about a to, lot. They're about oh. to they're okay. about to get an award. So the award is my John Reed's award for most watchable, consistently watchable enterprise related content video. These two guys, congratulations! Wow. Whoa. Oh, now see. That stumped the Godfather gum, drum roll, crowd cheers. Man, he's got it down. There, Very there you go. from you. C- congratulations for that. And and I know I know the I can hear the objection already, which is, but John, these guys are your pals. You know this isn't fair. This is totally rigged. Well, a couple of things. First of all, I use an object criteria, and it's very simple. How many shows do I actually watch myself and enjoy? I think that's pretty wow. objective. How's that? And, and you know what, like there's some honorable mentions I want to get to, cause I know you guys are thinking of some other producers and yes, I want to mention a couple others, but I'm not going to do that yet because I okay. got a mystery guest crashing the show later. I'm going to go over that with them once these two exit stage left. So I will be announcing a few other notable entries. And in general, I do want to point out that this so-called enterprise analyst media contingent is, I think in general, producing better content than brands on this topic. And this is one of the reasons why I want to have the show today, because it's kind of amazing to me that a bunch of us with pretty limited resources compared to brands are, in my opinion, producing a lot better content. And I think that can change, and I think it should change. So we're going to talk about that today. But um, before I do that, if you guys can just let me go on a quick rant, which is, the rant is as follows. I don't really understand why brands are getting so obsessed with using AI to to blast creativity off of their responsibilities collectively. That's not what AI is for, folks. I'm sorry. And it's a terrible excuse for not getting exceptional content out the door. Please stop. Why should you care about exceptional content? Let me give you the short version because I've written about this so extensively, it's ridiculous. Here's the short version. You should care about exceptional content because A, attention is crucial, especially for people that are not drinking your Kool-Aid. And number two, Content is one of the best ways at scale to establish some level of brand trust. And trust is going to be the predominant theme in the age of deep fakes and everything else to get people, including buyers, to trust your brand. So that's why you should care about content and creating exceptional content. And no, AI doesn't get you off the hook for that. How's that? I'm right with you. Is that really, a, that wasn't a rant. That was just the truth right there. I mean, that's All right. Tell the truth. I mean, look, one thing. Uh, and Brent's heard me say this like 20 million times at least. We all, we've talked for a million years about separating signal from noise. And I'm saying, no, this is near where you separate signal from signal, right? And, that, and you want exceptional content is the signal you're, that you provide that separates you, right? Um, signal from, there's a lot of good stuff out there as well as obviously crap, but you don't have to worry about the crap anymore. People have filters in their heads. They know what to do. Yep. And you have to worry about the other signal, right? Which And if you don't produce exceptional content, then right. you're not standing out. So this is signal from signal. Yes, indeed. And, and also, I think that's interesting because when you think about competing for attention, it's much more fluid now, right? So even when you're thinking about B2B stuff and enterprise stuff, you're thinking, yeah. well, this person is watching, uh, you know, what is the new Game of Thrones show or they're, or they're streaming TikTok or they're watching some pretty entertaining stuff. And so it's like, so what constitutes exceptional? And I think that's really an interesting conversation because that's where brands, I think, also get on the wrong track here because a lot of times exceptional is not high production value storytelling. That, that can happen. But a lot of times what really gets me is some of the stuff you guys have done. So for example, like when you guys have done these, these big thematic CRM player shows where you get executives from different vendors who are mortal enemies in their in in their day to day to actually collectively talk about stuff together that matters that to me is jugular exceptional content but it's not like 
You spent thousands of hours on scripts and productions. Yes, you guys are great with production values. You're better than me at that, and that's great. But that's, that's just incidental to this whole content thing. And brands out there, you can do this too. You can do this, man. And that's why I have these guys together today. So I think it's just a, a matter of being comfortable with uh, the subject matter and the people you invite and and giving them the space to to do what they do. I, I think if we've done anything right, I think that's probably the kind of the sweet, uh, the secret sauce is, you know, just things that are really interesting to us individually and, and collectively. And we'll be like, hey, what about doing something like this? And you're like, hey, you know, that sounds like a good idea. Hey, who do you want to be a part of this? Oh, let's get these guys. These, you know, and it's and it's 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 not AI driven. <laughs> you know, it's it's WE driven. I guess it's because you know we've been around a long time. And you can see the gray in my beard for Speak that. Speak for yourself. <laughs> and, yeah, and and we know a lot of really good people that not, not only are they experts in what they do, but they have a personality. They got a sense of humor. And when you're able to kind of marry all that together and then get out of the way, it it makes for Something that I would like to watch if I wasn't involved in it. It's sort of like what you were saying, John. I mean, that's the thing. It's it goes to human dynamics always, right? I, look, the the reality is very simple. We're people, right? And and everyone who watches us is a person. And every everybody who hates us is a person. Everybody who likes us is a person. And guess what? They all have their own lives, and they have their own likes and dislikes and things they think. So what we tried we do is we say, all right, we get that, and consequently. We haven't. We create a framework, and that's all we're doing. Really, we're saying here's a framework to work with everybody. Let's work with it. See what happens. And we're not. We get inquiries all the time from people who are going to be on the show from their PR people, for the most part, uh, saying, uh, "Can you give us the questions in advance to tell us what the show is going to be about?" And we say, "No, no, we're not going to do that. We're, that's not what we do." And, and we tell them, "Look, we're not trying to blindside you and make you feel like crap." That's not the idea of the show. The idea of the show is to get some knowledge out there that people actually can understand, not just hear you spout, right? So, uh, and that's been the foundation of the players for 15 years and all the shows we have, that's kind of their foundation too. Yeah, but now if we're able to make you feel bad or feel like crap, that's like a side benefit, but that's not the, that's right. the intent. That's the intent is to real. The intent is to have fun while talking about stuff that we're we're interested in, right. and if we're able to get people that uh, can do that same thing, we you know we don't have a lot of times we don't even have set questions. We'll be like, look, we'll wait until we do the show. A lot of times, never do we have set yeah. questions. That's why when people ask a, you, can you give us uh, some uh, some questions? Like, no, we don't even know what the questions are yet. You know. And look, to be honest, the one other thing, just I don't necessarily recommend this, but. Brent and I will often on Wednesday say, do we have a guest for tomorrow? We say, no. Uh, oh, okay, well, what do you think? We How about whoever? And what we want to do this on that? And, oh, okay. And that's it. I mean, that's the planning. The planning is, uh-oh, it's Wednesday. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, and I do want to mention briefly that one of the fascinating things about more unscripted environments is that they do take a little planning sometimes. And so a lot of times when you guys will be like, oh, same guests are on, that's because I didn't have time to really reach out to someone new and educate them around the format. Um, and that's why a lot of times we return to our go-to people is because mm -hmm. they understand and they're comfortable in the environment. But eventually it does catch on. And I want to hit to these questions and then I want to uh, point out something because I want to give brands some takeaways from this conversation and sure. not just like bash them. Uh, Thomas says too much agreement so far. This is an important point, Thomas. Um, I don't believe in faux debate. Um, so I believe in natural disagreement, so I can't promise you exciting fireworks. Sorry. <laughs> um, what I can promise you is people that take strong positions during a show. If we happen to agree, then that is what it is. Amen. Uh, Tim, Tim says, I would argue that average content is not differentiated. Uh, uh, that's just noise. I, I tend to agree with you, Tim, that most content is not differentiated these days. But the cool thing is that differentiating your content is actually not that hard. It just takes a little determination. By the way, on the AI topic, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that today, but Brent and I did a separate show, uh, which you can search for on my channel if you want, where we got into more how AI is helping us do our jobs better. I, we don't have enough time to get into that today. But, but there is a role for AI in kind of helping to 
uh, produce clips and distribute clips and all of that. So AI is there. It's not irrelevant. It's just not at the core of what I want to get at today. And then Tim says, the key is that those speaking and writing should have domain experience and dynamic when presenting. So that's something well, we'll get yeah, back to. Yeah, that's basically a description of an ideal guest, right? So uh, of any top in any way. So, but then, but they don't, have, to be honest, they don't have to, they have to have strong, well-founded opinions. They have to be well-founded. That's key. I don't think, well, look, we've had a lot of people on the show who aren't necessarily domain experts in any fundamental sense, but they, they, they are knowledgeable about it. They have opinions about it and they can justify their opinions. And that's fine, right? We, as long as there's something to the, a value that somebody gets from it. Look, the other side, honestly, we recognize another thing. The show's an hour. That's it. Okay, in one hour, we're not convincing anybody of a massive life change. We're not solving everybody's problems. And if we're solving one person's problems, then every other listener is bored. Right. So we have to basically put out things for people to your point, John, that walk away with. And in the course of that, people are also entertained with it. Right. That's it. Right. That's all we can do. Right. So so I think we're on to something kind of interesting here, which is what are some of the ingredients that make for success that the brands can actually do? And this is also a how not to on boo for questions that are presented and asked for in advance. Now you're heading down the wrong road, right? And and I think <laughs> I, I think in general we can agree that over rehearsed enterprise content takes people down the wrong path in this, right? This is one of the areas to avoid. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, look, I agree, and and the but this the other side of that from the standpoint of the brand itself, which is they should trust the person they're putting on the show to handle the show perfectly well. That's why they're on the show. Right. Um, they don't need that person doesn't need to have everything pre-planned. They're smart. Right. Let them do what they do. Right. They might need a little bit of, you know, that media training in the background. Right. To know where they shouldn't go in a live format. Right. But once they're on the show, you have to have that trust that they have that and they know what the boundaries are Fair and enough. what they can and can't say. Right. Because I think when you when you guys just outline these points, you you get to some key issues here, which is you do, you like this live dynamic. That seems really important, right? That that we're not doing all this pre recorded stuff all the time. Now, granted, there's still a role for, especially yeah. with like customers, to do these recorded sessions. I get that they feel more comfortable, but there's something special, right, about doing this live without a net. Yeah. Well, I I think one of the uh, things that maybe is key to not screwing it up. I don't know how if it's the key to making it really great, but at least you're not screwing it up. Is it, you got to look at it as not some form of just another marketing thing. You, these conversations that like we have on the show is they're not meant for marketing. They're meant for thought leadership. They're they're meant for in, you know in, in actual meaningful engagement. Now, in a lot of instances, because of what's being said and how it's being said, it turns out that. Some of these clips that come out of these conversations are, are very marketable, but the intent, the initial intent isn't for marketing. It's for having interesting conversations and hopefully not only the conversations that you see on, on the screen, but also in the comment section. And, and if you're able to, because if, if you look at it as marketing, you're not going to get any real good stuff on screen or in the comment section. But if you approach it as, oh, this is a great topic. Oh, these are some really good people that uh, that have really good ideas and know how to express them. And it also engages the audience of people who are watching the live stream and, and invite them to be a part of the show via the comment section. That's the best marketing you get. But if you come at it specifically as a marketing venture, you've already kind of lost. Bingo. So I think you nailed another one there, right? Which is live, but also interactive that there's a value on the interactive aspect. And what what drives me crazy, and I had this happen to me again a couple times this summer, these like more scripted formats where there's questions rolling in, but we don't get to them till f five minutes before the end of the show when people are exiting. And then there's always the whole, we'll get to you by email. Do you understand that the whole point is not to answer the questions 
but to create a live experience. So the thing I love about your shows is when I show up, I know that if I put something in the chat, it's probably going to wind up on the screen or as a point of discussion during the show. And that's really interesting, right? That's a, that's a different way of thinking about content. Well, you know, to that point, there's another opportunity actually with that, which goes even a little, um, a little further, which is we have actually done things like when we see comments that are rolling pretty well, we literally will bring the person onto the show live from the comment section. Right. Right. And that's, again, we want that, that engagement to us is more important than anything else we're doing really. Because th look, the other side is the people who are commenting, they're intelligent human beings with, a, again, well-considered ideas. They could just as well be a guest. So why not make them an actual guest? And, and right. doing that, I mean, it led to the uh, world-famous blueberry bagel battle. Right. Okay. But, uh, but uh, also doing some experimenting and trying some things out. Because uh, one of the things that has worked best for us from an engagement standpoint is Stump the Godfather. It, it, it started out as just... Oh, you say. <laughs> I'm <laughs> the victim started, here. It started out as... I don't even remember how it started out, but we did something. You did we it. did it. And I was like, wow, we're getting some... Some people, you know, want to guess along with this thing. And so I was like, why don't we just do this every week? And every week, you know, we have a lot of fun with it. Paul, you know, beats his head on his mic sometimes. Uh, but people love to be a part of it because they get a chance to, to throw their thought in there, their guess. And, and that's something that now is a weekly st uh, staple of this thing because of the engagement opportunity. Aging me two years for everyone I ask the age. <laughs> So this is interesting from Tim Crawford and Tim, by the way, um, I want to get you on a future show because he's you've got great. a lot, you've got a lot to share on these topics, including a, a ton of good stuff on CIOs. Tim, Tim, Tim's one of my pesky questions, specialist favorites where <laughs> when he raises his hand at an event, I know something good's about to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you can ask something important. Um, he says here, humans are imperfect. Natural conversations are more interesting and enjoyable to listen to. I think that's really true, but I also want to double down on that from an enterprise perspective that, that we have so much overproduced, overmarketed content in the enterprise that I think the entertainment value of this live unscripted kind of thing is really high. And also, my view, I don't know what you guys think, my view is that it also really generates trust and confidence in a brand when you can sense that they're comfortable putting their spokespeople out there with a little bit of an uncertain environment. Keyword. Right where it's not so controlled like a controlled scripted briefing would be. You know, people tend to trust brands by the people who represent the brands, right? Um, they don't see the, the, look, there's two ways that you, you, you see it. They use a product. They like the product. it consistently works for them. That's one way you trust the brand. But the other way is you trust the people who are representing the brand. And that's just the nature of the people, you know, who were there and how they communicate. I mean, there are people out there, uh, Brent and I were having a conversation about um, somebody the other day, uh, yesterday actually, who was um, had a tape that wasn't supposed to be shown uh, or a recording. That was, and he's a very old school guy and he's wrong about everything he was saying. And, you know, back in his day, under those circumstances though, he was, he was a trusted person. But now he's out of context, out of line. You can't trust what he's saying because it's just straight out wrong. But the idea of that trusted individual is critical. So when you see someone, like you see someone on a show, your show, our show, that we that you like, you're going to automatically tend to trust them. It doesn't mean, by the way, always the trust is legitimate, but you're going to tend to trust them because you want to trust them because you like them. But once again, I think, John, that gets back to, uh, something that is very difficult for these companies to do is uh, feel like they're losing control or feel like they're losing the narrative. And if you right. approach these shows with that as kind of the foundational pieces, nobody's going to want to watch because it's not going to feel authentic. You, If you, like Paul saying, we, we go to all these events, we get a chance to speak to all these different people at these companies. And guess what? These folks have personalities. They have great senses of humor beyond being subject matter experts and, and you know, head of this and, and head of that. 
they got really good senses of humor. You know, one of the funniest guys uh, that we spoke to, over, you know, the first part of the year at an event, Nick Zitson. Yeah, he's the chief strategy officer for our service now. But that dude is funny. I mean, it, all you have to do is watch our show with him, and he's giving us zingers, and he's vi- using some nice, very dry wit. And it makes us laugh. It makes us feel better about what we're doing, let alone I think it makes for a better uh, conversation to watch. So it's like you guys, you, you folks are not letting your talent be as talented as they can be because you're too afraid to give up a little bit of control, which you really don't have in the first place. Right. So one thing I really enjoy seeing uh, from the two of you, and Brent, you've done a lot of this in the last year, is you, you, you get these really cool sets on the road where you're doing something like outside or someplace where you kind of put people at ease. And then they're just talking comfortably about their experiences. And it turns out that brands know a whole lot about the market and what their customers care about if they can be put in a relaxed setting where they're not promoting stuff. And so what I want to get across to brands is you can create that environment yourself too. And I'm not saying don't engage Brent Leary in projects because you should totally (laughs) engage Brent in projects. But the fact is there's way more stuff to do than Brent and Paul and I could ever do. Like, so, so you can do that too. You can create that same, in my opinion, that same kind of environment. And, and it would really be beneficial to look at some of those clips and see how it's done. Well, you know, from their standpoint, well, they, in effect, and it actually goes directly to what you were saying, walk outside, right? I mean, literally, the brands stay in their damn offices, and they have production companies to come in either internally or externally, and they all have very set ways of dealing with it. But the other thing that they do, which they miss, and it keeps going to what Brent is actually saying here, too, is they tend to think that they have to represent uh, they, they are a business that has to act like a business so that the metaphors of being a business are clear to the people listening and that they have certain words they have to say and things they have to do and environments they have to show in order to prove that they are a legitimate business. When Brent's saying, these are people with personalities, let them, they work. Look, you think of it from a different standpoint, a very simple one too. One of the things that's always made the Salesforce analyst relations team strong was John Tashik's way of approaching, which is, hey, guess what? It's analyst relations. You're going to have relationships with these people. They are going to be people who are humans like you, and you want to be their friends, and they want to be your friends, and you're probably going to become friends. That's fine. Just do me a favor. When you're dealing with them, just keep in mind who you work for. Simple as that. And if you apply that to exactly what we were just talking about, it's exactly that. Yeah. And Tim talks about how we should be looking at this from the customer perspective more the enterprise. I definitely think so. And Tim, thanks for engaging with me around the next gen analyst relations stuff you and I have been thinking about that I just published on because yeah, I sort of fit, I I kind of fit this creative content into that framework as well of, of serving customers in different ways by amplifying their concerns in our content. And I would suggest that we start with the premise that, getting back to your point, Brett, that, that as brands, you lost control of the narrative a long time ago. So just let that go because you're not getting it back. Like, we don't get to control our own narratives anymore, folks. The, the market, the conversation decides our narrative for us. We can have input on it, but we don't control it. So let's start there. And, and we're, but one thing I want to identify, because I think I'm starting to flag a bunch of characteristics that you guys have pulled off. The other one I really want to note is community, because I think beyond just interacting with your people, what I pick up on from from your CRM players in particular is the community that's developed around what you do. I think that's special, but I think also brands can achieve some of that. What do you think? Paul? Uh, Well, look, I mean, the irony of that, I guess, is brands have theoretical communities um, that they actually can draw from. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, how when we talk about sports, we talk about you don't need to create advocates. You just have to figure out how to manage them because they're your fans, right? The brands have people who are already in place in various kinds of communities. They don't draw on them. They basically leave them, leave them in a hole and let them do whatever they do. What we've done and what we've deliberately done for that reason is build the community. And, you know, it started around the happy hours, really, in COVID kind of allowed us to, I'll call it, 
create it. But the idea has always been drawing on the, the expertise of the people who care to listen to us. Right. And, uh, and that's, it's not that the only formal community thing we do is the happy hour. Uh, and that's hardly formal. Um, but it happens but, though, because like, if I show up at a CRM Converse show, like a lot of people are just there because they come every time. They don't even, they don't care what you're talking about or who you're interviewing. They feel a part of what you're doing. And I think that's a big light bulb moment around that brands can do some of that too, if they want to. It's pretty easy too. I mean, we, yeah. we have uh Sven, a guy that uh, I've never met. I don't think Paul, you've met, ever Not met him person, face to face. No. But Sven, we became familiar with Sven because he he was he watched the show every week, and then at some point he would do this thing like at the beginning of every show he would say a hello or say something in a different language, and we thought it was really fun. We thought it was good. It was all his ideas, so we were like, well, why don't we just make this the moment of Sven and you know the beginning of the show? So it's it's not even you have to do these formal things. It can be very organic based on. You know, the, the, as the relationship grows over time, it's like, oh my God, why don't we just do that? And, and it happens. So I think, I, right. It's really important. It's kind we of got to stump the Godfather fan. Oh, Hi, God, Samuel, how the you heel. Doing? Come on. <laughs> I'm no longer your mentor. It's, it's over. Right. So look, here, here's what we got. We got four minutes left before you guys walk out stage left. And then I got a mystery guest coming on. Uh, so the, sh so we will roll on. But before we leave, we got to talk about Players Production Network a little bit because I think this is really cool what you guys are trying to do here because you basically created a bunch of shows that, that you help to manage a bit like as far as the infrastructure, but then you set your guests loose. And they're real shows. They're not just like another... I mean, yes, there's some punditry going on there, but, but each one has a little bit of an angle. So how did this all come about? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, well, Brent and I have been doing... CRM players for what, 14 years at the time, 2022. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, 14 years. And we, you know, to be honest, you know, we, we were already by that time experimenting with our gear and everything like that. And we were really interested in all the gear and stuff like that. And we were talking, we were just talking and we started to chat about the idea of, well, what about some other shows that would be either spinoffs or something like that? And then basically in, I'd say July of 2022, we decided, you know what? There's certain things going on in this world. It's transferring over to millennials now and they consume differently. And the biggest problem we right now have is, and we understood this, was distribution. And we've kind of managed to do something with CRM players that challenges the typical ideas of distribution. Why don't we build out a network that really takes that on and, and begins to build it out. But the idea was to be, look, let's get the ideas from the people who will do the shows, right? And we had our own ideas and we implement our own shows, like Few Good Minutes is Brent. I have Talking Headless. I do that thing with Kenny Lauer, with uh, Engage with Paul and Kenny, and every show is different. But we have In the Hot Seat and all the other ones. But they're, they're the product of the people doing them, right? And we just, the, what we do, and this is the why we can give it some institutional foundation is we handle the production, right? We handle the costs of production. We handle the assets. Brent will actually produce a lot of the shows, but we teach them how to do it themselves. And then Brent still handles every single clip that comes out. I handle the website, but we, we handle kind of the back end. but we leave people free to do their shows and develop its personalities. The idea is though to be there for them and to brand it so that there's a place for everyone to go. I'll just let's say this last thing. And, and John, I, uh, what am I saying? John, you know, he, you know who he is, uh, but that's John I, Reed. <laughs> he's also who, what, what's his name there? Cause you named him. Oh, bro yes, Hammer. Man. There it is. I was oh, waiting for him. <laughs> oh, bro uh, Hammer. So the, the last thing, cause you said it a number of times in this, in the, during this show, it's a show. It's not a seminar. It's not right. a set. It's, it's not a session. We come at it as a show and show ha has a meaning. It's there's components to it. it. Yeah. It's information. It's also entertainment. It's, it's, uh, it's engagement. It's not uh, meant to be like a webinar. It's not meant to be like a traditional form of uh, thought leadership. It's conversational thought leadership. And that conversation comes with, you know, entertaining inf ins uh, a part of it as well as insights. And I think that's the one thing if they could just take away from this, 
this is not meant to be a, a, a traditional way of engaging your audience. No. Particularly from a, a traditional marketing perspective, it's supposed to be conversational. It's supposed to be interactive. It's supposed to be fun as well as insightful. And if you're able to pull all, all that off and give it a chance to be all those things, you have a much more likelihood of getting people to want to watch and be a part of it. So that's kind of where I come at it from that kind of perspective. And I'll say one last thing that's a little counter to what you said in the beginning, John, which is, or Brohammer, excuse me, um, which is that we do pay a lot of attention to production. We do. Right. We actually do spend a good deal of time trying to make sure and, and that there are standards for every show. Like, if they're yeah, deficient yeah, yeah. in equipment, we make sure they get it. You know, those sure. kind of things. Because we part of the entertainment value is the, how nice it looks to people when they watch it, right? And uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a baseline to production, and that's a right. longer conversation in right. terms of how to get that right without without get it, overdoing oh. it. Um, that's a longer talk, but we're not going to be able to do that one today. What? Because you guys are out of time. I'm cutting you off. You said you had to leave at the half hour, so holding you to it. Thanks for joining, and, and there was a lot of wisdom shared, and I'm going to break that down in the next segment. See you guys later. Thanks a lot for everything. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Catch sir. You. See Appreciate it. And now we are going to shift a little bit because I'm going to bring on another surprise guest to continue this conversation. Um, and what we're going to do is we are going to break down what we've learned so far because I promised you this wasn't just going to be like bashing brands. Uh, I want to really give some good lessons here because I think a lot of this is actually quite doable in this context. Uh, so now we have our surprise guest coming on and you are added to the stage and you have a nice hat hey, for John. Us today. <laughs> and you are Thomas Weber Knight. How are you doing? I'm doing fine and your pronunciation gets better every time. <laughs> yeah, man. I don't, I didn't butcher your name quite as badly as usual. <laughs> No, well, you're doing great. Excellent. Sounds good. Uh, so, uh, so Thomas, I assumed you were listening into a good chunk of that. Did you catch some of that? Cool. Of course I did. Yeah. Excellent. One can't listen enough to the three of you, actually. Cool. Well, uh, you're on for a few different reasons. Uh, one is because when I thought about this show, I was kind of saying, who, who in this domain do I watch the most? And your show is one of the shows that I tune into like whenever I can. So, so you also get one of the awards. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll take that. My God, what's my autofocus doing today? Am I that blurry? So, uh, yeah, I don't know what's going I, on, but, but that's, that's part of the game. We gotta, we gotta press on. Yeah. So, um, so you heard a lot of what we broke out and I'm going to break this down for, yeah. for brands. So you kind of hear some of the key points, but, did you hear anything in terms of like, you, I know you do a lot of similar things in your CRM convo show. You create in many ways a similar kind of live interactive environment. Mm -hmm. Are there other things that we miss that you think are really important ingredients to have a successful show? I didn't hear one particular word, although it got mentioned implicitly, which is authenticity. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, the, the three of us who are running this year I'm Convos, we have very different styles, each of us. Uh, whether we, and again, each of us particularly like all of the other guys' traits or not, doesn't matter. That we are as we are, this is what makes it interesting, but which also helps shedding light from different angles. This is one part. The, the other part is, of course, that's true for the guest as well. As Paul and Brent, we are not really looking after marketing, 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 self-marketing. We are looking after thought leadership. Whether we always succeed or not, that's on another plate. Sometimes right. you also run into own missionary errands, yeah? so, which is part of the game too. Right. Not always helpful, but it keeps it at least lively, lively, and again, uh, helps opening up different angles. I think you, you, you honed in on something, and I want to get in with you a little bit to a couple things on entertainment value and attention span. So remind me to get back to those topics. Um, but I think one of the 
one of the ways to get to entertainment is through the authentic clash of personalities. Like, mm-hmm. like, cause you asked about this debate thing earlier and I don't really like faux debates, but I do like it when personalities clash. And, mm-hmm. and I think like you see that in many forms of entertainment, like in, in music, mm-hmm. you see it a lot because a lot of really great bands, <clears throat> their members don't really like each other that much and they have a lot of fights. Right. But they have a chemistry. Mm-hmm. Right. And, yeah. and I think that's an interesting component for the viewer, right. Is yeah. they know that there's going to be some clash because you go at it in different ways. And I think you and I have some of that, like where if you and I talk about something for an hour, we're going to disagree on a bunch of stuff. And yeah, and that's good. And that's interesting for the viewer. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I do sometimes do shows with Holger Mueller after events because Holger and I, we have a lot of disagreements and, and it's just kind of natural that they will emerge. So I think that's an interesting thing from a brand perspective, because I think brands don't often think of it that way. They think of it like, Oh, we need to have a coherent message all the time. But the thing is, you can have an underlying message that you kind of agree on and still have plenty mm-hmm. of disagreements, right? Like, yeah. like, like, for example, I think you and I fund- fundamentally agree that we're here to serve customers and we do that through creating honest conversations with people who know their shit, right? So we agree yeah. on that, but, but there's a lot of room for disagreement on top of that agreement, right? Yeah, I mean, look at how we present each other, right? Or ourselves, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bloody english <laughs> so i mean i'm i'm a bit out of out of um figure today wearing my prop <laughs> yeah but what i fundamentally have is a very very well an extremely simple background which probably contributes to the current autofocus issues whereas you have your own brand a different right. brand yeah so and uh, same with ralph and marshall Right, and then in my shows, or on our shows, actually, so we we have established an identity, an individual identity, right? And again, whether we are fully in agreement with the other one's identity or not is irrelevant, as long as we work with it constructively. Right, exactly. So I want to hand out a couple more informal awards, and this is not to. Uh, overlook a lot of people because there's a lot of video that I don't get a chance to watch. And, and like I said before, from the sort of analyst and media contingent, there's a lot of people doing pretty cool stuff. So I, I, I don't want to exclude anyone, but I do want to call out a couple of my personal favorites, which is based only on the criteria of who catches my attention that I tend to watch. One of them is Disrupt TV uh, with, with Ray and Vala. And I think. Mm-hmm. One of the things they do really well, and I crash their show at times, so they invite me on, but even when I'm not like a part of things, what I think they do really well, they have a really breezy format because they have usually three different segments in one show. And I think they do a really good job of really putting the guest in the center of things. So you don't hear a whole lot from the two of them around, oh, we're, we're pundits, we have, we're big influencers, mm-hmm. you know, and those guys have massive followings. They focus on their guest, and I think that format works. So, so Disrupt TV gets an award for me. And then also I want to uh, give a call out to analyst David Smith, who focuses a lot on the collaboration space. He shows up at shows with gear. I don't know how he kind of like hauls his gear. He has his own secrets. We could ask him sometime. His stuff is just so well produced, man. I mean, he makes, he makes me look so bad in terms of the gear I bring to shows, but but I got to give him a call out because he does it on his own, but I think he really has a high standard with production. And while I have been a little critical of like obsessing over production values, I do think that looking good is great. And, yeah. and if you can do it and do it portably, that's awesome because the whole key to like doing good stuff on site is quickly set up and capture that moment. Right. Yeah. So, so I don't have any problem with good production values as long as it doesn't inhibit you from doing that. Right. So if it takes you like three hours to set up, then I don't like your approach because mm-hmm. that's not going to capture the moment. But guys like David and Brent, they'll go to a show and they'll be set up in like 15 or 30 minutes or less and they have a great set and it looks awesome and sounds awesome. Good job, guys. And David and Brent come with totally different setups. I mean, Dave runs around with his big ass <laughs> high quality camera. Yep. Well, real camera camera whereas 
brand is tending towards smaller devices right which are set up far faster right and so they are still deliver an extremely good well image and, and audio quality which right is not to be forgot absolutely for 100%. So this, yeah so do you have any you would add to the list of of my informal awards are there any other people or shows that have captured your consistent attention yeah uh, dep depending on time of work so there are, I, i'd add two <laughs> one is hosted by a guy john john reed oh so he, he sometimes does incredibly good stuff no actually my friday afternoon than, party crash all right yeah cool. more than a well bit i don't i'm not does, eligible yeah. for awards on my own show but thanks yeah uh but, and then what i very often like again so it's might be incestuous but well brent and john lawson when they are passing the the microphone on yes. friday afternoons so the, these are current topics discussed from very different angles and they, they actually bring the disagreement to an art form right I mean, they're, they are <laughs> bashing in quotes <laughs> at each other all the time basically right so so, so one cool thing about that show when i I really wanted to do a Friday afternoon show because I felt that Friday afternoon is kind of my vibe. Like I like a pretty outspoken, casual, mm -hmm. I imagine people with drinks in hand during my show. Mm -hmm. So when I wanted to do it, I contacted Brent specifically to make sure that our timing worked so that my show didn't mm -hmm. go over his because yeah. that show is a great show. And he actually ended up moving the time back an hour. So that was really cool. And on a permanent basis, mm -hmm. so the shows could coincide. Yeah. Um, and his show's well worth watching the past the mic. And yeah. the only reason I didn't mention it is because I already gave him awards. So how many awards could he really have room for in his bookshelf? <laughs> well, but, no, we, no, we got another one. <laughs> but the cool thing, yeah, but the cool thing about that show is because they have such a deep relationship, yeah. you can tell that they argue all the time off camera yeah. as well. Yeah. And so it really translates nicely. And I think, you know, like going back to brands, I think brands can do a lot of these things. And yeah. so like, yeah, it's great when brands work with some of these folks and do shows with them, but brands could do this too. This is not out of yeah. the reach. This is kind of my big message that I want to gear towards uh, in the remaining time that we have is that this is doable. And the reason that it's doable is that the entertainment aspect, okay, there's some level of production values, but you, unless you're a big business to consumer brand, you don't really have to think about telling complicated, compelling narrative story structures with elaborate scripts and actors and productions and all that really expensive stuff. Like actually in the B2B side, what we identified during the show is that entertainment doesn't require all of that. It mm -hmm. requires putting people in a comfortable environment, unscripted, live, people who know their shit, who aren't afraid to disagree, um, sometimes with some interesting structures in place to guide the conversation. But I just don't think that this type of entertainment is is too cost prohibitive for brands to do. No. Do you? No, no, it's not. And I'm well. Once in a while, I'm doing some for brands, and there I actually tend to prepare because there's often a customer involved. Right. And well, they, they are. They need, say, know the, they need to know they, the they, they need to know the parameters of what know to expect. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. fire they are exposing themselves to. Yes. And and the other aspect is this is a story over time, across different brands actually, and it, the story is how do buyers customers use enterprise software? How did how do they go to choose it? What are the problems when? implementing it what are the problems in use how do they work over them and across them which help do they get and ultimately what's the trust level between vendor and buyer there so this of course then can be done best i'd say by someone who, who is not directly associated well not a brand member so that that needs to be an outsider else it's something like exec of company a interviewing exec of company a about company a which is kind of pointless yeah exactly 
And and I do want to make the point that that customer based interviews are a different can of worms, yeah. and and they require a different type of preparation than say doing stuff with your own team or interviewing hmm. brand you know vendor executives who are hmm. used to going public. Customers have a lot of concerns around what they want to reveal about their projects, what they can and can't say yeah. on camera and stuff like that. And so there's a different type of preparation with customers. Yeah. And that's a little bit beyond the scope of our show today to dissect all of that. But the gist of it is that the customer needs to feel a level of trust and comfort. Yes. But still, I don't think it pays off to overscript those conversations too much. I think no. it, it's more about that the customer feels that they trust someone like you, yeah. that you're you're not out there to sandbag their project with like, it, yeah. you know, gotcha type questions they weren't expecting and stuff yeah. like that. But but it's more of just understanding that yeah. that people really like these customer stories, but they do. I don't know about you, but one of the things I really look for when I do these is I really look for customers that are comfortable talking about some of the challenges because every project has those. And we don't yeah. just want to have these success stories yeah. that don't go over like, what were some of the issues, like the inevitable change issues or the, or okay. the scope creep problems or, or you know, or, you know. Right. Like, how do we handle yeah. all that? So yeah. it's best, I think, when the customer can open yeah. up a little bit, right, yeah. about that. Yeah. And that's why also in these types of, let's let's stick to customer conversations or conversations with cast of customers about brands, I always tell them, hey, this is not gospel, this script. This is the, the line of conversation that we are going to have. And depending on what you are telling me, I, I might take a detour. Because this right. is just interesting, right? Might not end, it, might not make it into the, the final, the director's cut, <laughs> right? But but still, it's it's interesting information, yes, and that also keeps it authentic and vivid. Yep. So and it keeps them at ease that hey, or well, at ease as well as on a bit on their toes. Uh, be, because it is not fully scripted. So that is the, the balance between authenticity and enticing, interesting information. So in, in my posts that I've written about this topic, and I've written a lot about B2B content strategy, I've gone pretty hard on this whole thing around, yeah. <clears throat> around relevance over entertainment. And and the reason I've done that is because what I wanted to get across to brands is that is that on the when you get obsessed with entertainment as as your goal, then you're really up against it because you're competing with YouTube shorts, you're competing with cat videos, which are really hard to compete <laughs> with. You're competing with baby goats. Um, I don't know, watching a baby goat jump around for two minutes, that's really hard to compete with. <laughs> you're competing with you're competing with the Game of Thrones knockoffs that I described earlier. You're competing with uh, you know, political coverage of hot issues with like, you know, high intense stakes for culture and society. And so I've just tried to encourage brands to back off of that a little bit and think more about relevance in the sense that like so when a customer attends a webinar on like cloud migrations, for example, mm -hmm. like they are there for information that will help their product and careers. So the point is that if you have experts sharing good information, then you don't have to worry about too much scripted entertainment. But I'm thinking that in a way, what we're really doing is we're redefining what entertainment means. We're not saying don't entertain because I think the entertainment like really comes out, right? Like like in the stuff you do, for example, like you've, you've hosted me on a bunch of these AI debates, right? And while we don't always have these fierce arguments, there are disagreements, but it's really like there is something really entertaining about that structure of going at it around mm -hmm. issues that matter. And so in the course of this, what I think we've done today for brand takeaways, and tell me if you agree, is not no entertainment, but more like redefine entertainment in a way that by the way, happens to be more affordable because you're not doing all this rehearsing and all this stuff, but redefine entertainment in terms of things like authenticity, experts, unscripted conversations, jugular live experiences where you're interacting with people and interacting with the audience, often whom are just as smart as the participants. So you bring them in early and often. 
And like we had today, a ton of fascinating questions in the chat, including some from you. Um, and, and then that sense of community and that community is engaging. And that makes mm -hmm. me say, you know what? I don't want to miss Thomas's show because I'm going to interact. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to be able to learn something about CX today that I didn't know before. And, and yeah, that's actually worth it to me. I'm going to put my sports center highlights on pause because this is actually mm -hmm. deeply relevant. So I think it's a combination of that, right? It's relevancy, but it's also redefining entertainment in a way that that works for our industry where there's so much overscripted overproduced content and say you know what mm -hmm. live without a net is pretty damn entertaining in our industry yeah. what do you think yeah, yeah pretty pretty much right so it, it, the question is where overproduction starts and underproduction ends yes yeah. so uh, for, for example today right now i'm annoyed as heck why right, my out of focus, auto, right. the yeah, autofocus? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that that is where underproduction starts in my eyes. Yeah, right. Overprodu overproduction is definitely reached where we have a, something fully scripted. Right. Yeah, so the, because that doesn't add to the body of knowledge that is out there, and right. even if, to your point, so learn something new, this learned something new might actually be a confirmation of a position that you hold. So uh, right. the, the minimum learning there is, so, hey, I'm not alone yeah. on this planet. I'm not that off the mark. Yeah. So, or at least I'm not alone off the mark. <laughs> so, and that that needs trust. And it, it also needs trust of the AR or marketing departments into their own people, not only into the one who does the the, the creation, because that's all often, I mean, CRM converse are, they are not shot. So this is us doing something with someone else. This someone else often happens to be a company exec. And while well, they are talking about their company, their experience, well, in the background of their company, about their experience, their knowledge, and what they learned. And this simply should not be controlled by or should not be put on a leash other than the guest's leash so this person himself herself yeah so that's 100%. that's the only one who controls it so so just real quick on this production values thing i think production values really emerge as an issue when they become distracting right so mm -hmm. if you're distracted because my audio is coming in and out for example then then production values have become an issue, right? Yeah. Um, and and I don't object to people spending a lot of money on looking good on camera and especially the audio, mm. right? The audio needs a whole lot of attention. Yeah. And, and and especially on site, we have to think a lot about audio versus background noise. And that can really impact, for example, duration of videos, right? Like so if I know on site that I have a lot of background noise, even if I have lav mics and stuff, it will affect the length of that content, right? Where I won't do an hour long live video show on site if there's a ton of background noise because I know yeah. that it's 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 too much to ask. So there is that. I, I don't object so much to that. When I when I object to production values, it has to do with things like, oh, let's do two rehearsals to test everyone's gear again and again and test the format. Yeah. And like at some point when you're over rehearsing too much, you're losing something. And, you know, yeah, one rehearsal to check quality I get to make sure, okay. But then after that, it's like, appreciate the fact mm. that the preparation is more about, here's the topics we really want to hit on. Like, like you'll do show notes where it's like, here's the top 10 things we want to mm. try to address. But you're not scripting it all out. And the more it gets scripted, the more you lose something because yeah. someone might come in, in the middle of a conversation in, in a live context and raise an issue that none of us thought of that's critically yeah. important. We got to be ready to shift gears and say the hell with our show notes. Yeah. You know, we'll save the last five points for the next time. Yeah. And that's exactly where things get really interesting if we manage by magic or however to get the audience, the participants engaged and to comment. And the, the worst thing that one then can do is just ignoring it, even if it's just briefly shown. Mostly it is, or very often it is, a point in itself that 
dives into a facet of the current conversation that is relevant and as worthwhile in your, pursuing. As in your question, which we're uh, circling uh, back uh, to now, the comment section is uh, important. What what can be done to get it really active? It's a really good question, right? Uh, and and I don't have all the it's, it's an honest one. <laughs> it's I don't have all one. the answers to that. But one <laughs> thing I think is important is conditioning people to know that their comments will be a part of the show every yeah. single time. Like, and, and so that's a big thing for my mm -hmm. show. When I launched my show, that was one of my singular things was the audience is as much a part of the show as the guests. And that goes into my mm -hmm. preparation for yeah. the show. I will tell the guests, expect to be interrupted. Like, expect me to interrupt you during mm -hmm. your discussions mm -hmm. with whatever the audience wants to say. So I do that in the prep because that's a cornerstone mm -hmm. of what I do. But I think a lot of the shows out there do that, the good ones do that to some extent, right? Like when I go to your shows, I know that if I put in an interesting comment, it is going to go on screen at some point. Yeah. Like, and the same thing with this, the Brandon Paul shows and stuff and the ones they do on players. Like most of those like bring in the comments. Every now and then you run into a host that, that loses track of that. And I think that's one thing, you know, when you think about host skills, that's one thing I would really recommend is that get used to be paying attention to the stream while you're talking to some extent. Now, you can have assistance to help you with that at first, so you're not, yeah. you know, if you're struggling with that at first, like, then get someone to help uh, to, to prompt you a bit. But, but the, the key is not to do it all yourself, but to be aware that shifting gears is important, yeah. right? And the ability to yeah. do that. And the good news is, it comes with experience. Just do do it a couple of times, then it works like me now ignoring this getting in and out of focus. But yeah. th that comes with doing it a couple of times. So this is nothing that is unattainable. This just comes naturally. And this is good for aspiring people. I mean, we are aspiring to it. Well, at least I am. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Now, there's there's three things that we haven't covered today that I want to get to and just shout out on and get your input on too. Um, and the three things are um, the role of AI in all of this. And I don't want to do that in detail, but, but to say that I've covered that in some other mm. uh, shows on this topic, but there is a, definitely a big role, even though I was really pushing back in the mm. beginning of the show yeah. on AI actually creating the core of the content. AI can do a whole bunch of stuff. All of us pretty much at this point use AI clip generator mm. services after the fact, for example. Yeah. There's a lot AI can do to help with the personalization and distribution of video content, everything mm. else. So there's a separate AI discussion that I've had a little bit in the past. We can do it again. I'm not anti-AI. I just want to push brands to not see AI as a solution for their, the silver bullet. for their creative challenges, which I think they need to embrace the creative challenges head on. So that's number one. But number two and three are related, which is the intention span issue and the, you know, what you might call like content fodder issue. Like, and I think they're connected in good ways. So for example, like not everyone is going to watch this video. Like a bunch of people have watched parts of it and we have pretty good yeah. audience engagement through this show, which is great. But, you know, once a show ends, there's not that many people that are going to want to watch the video replay of this show. Let's just face it. Like that's a lot, the, the live experience is more authentic for people because they can ask questions and all that shit, right? Once it over, like, like I don't expect a lot of people to watch the full replay, right? But the cool thing is that now you have a content asset that you can do things with. So mm. for example, like I will issue the full audio to my podcast audiences <clears throat> and the podcast audiences, they like the longer shows. They tell me sometimes, don't edit these like we want to hear. Because, you know, they're on the, they're literally on the treadmill at the gym, like their literal <laughs> treadmill, or they're stuck in traffic, or they're having a terrible experience at an airport. Yeah. And I love thinking about people like getting nice audio content that eases those frustrating times in their lives with interesting stuff that doesn't require total concentration, but, you know, gives them a sense. So all you audio people out there, this is for you. I love doing that. Mm. So that's good. But then it's also slicing and dicing the video in cool ways, right? Like, so there's all this inventory here that I can use. And I wish I had more time, frankly, to slice and dice it in different ways because I think yeah. that's really appealing for people. Yeah. So anyways, I'd love, to get, your, comes to I'd love to get your, yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on this because I think 
I think people are wrong that everything has to be short in an attention span context. And I really hate mm-hmm. that for the enterprise because I say again and again, you can't solve complex enterprise problems with TikTok sound bites. But for brands, that's what's really cool is there's so many things you can do with these longer clips because they can become mm-hmm. quotable stuff for blog posts. They can become shorter videos. They can become part of a a YouTube playlist on a particular topic or theme. So there's yeah. so much you can do with this after the fact, right? Yeah. I mean, the the key factor for people like us is time. Yeah. So that's, yep. we, we are doing this, of course, partly to promote our businesses. So there's no, no point about it. However, we can put only that much time into it, into getting the slicing and dicing done right so and th- this is precisely where with all of their flaws tools that generate clips come into picture right so let's i'm right now i'm running in, in kind of an experiment create one clip per day of each show for the seven subsequent days right so it means seven clips yeah so doing that manually Apart from me being constantly um, well <laughs> out of the picture taking notes to get the the exciting parts it takes me probably the whole a whole day if if not a bit more, having a tool that just gets some some buzzwords, some keywords, some quotable words to to search for. Well, that costs me the download, the time it takes to right. get it into the upload, and then generate a couple of clips, have you know, assess and post process a couple of clips that this thing generates. This is done in two hours at at most. Right. Is it as good as fully self produced? No, nah, clearly not. Is it good enough? I surely hope so. Yeah, I think in a lot of cases it is, and you know the um, and the tools are going to get better and and better in in a certain regard. Um, But I would just say brands have a big advantage over the likes of you and I in that capacity because they can use these tools, but they can also make use of some internal staff that that work around video production and content production in some cases. So, I I guess what I wanted to get across to brands is that these kind of more longer unscripted shows are a great source of content inventory yeah. for a variety of other content productions where AI can help you summarize, slice, dice, transcribe, pull quotes, yeah. you know, and, and so now you, you have this content engine. And so the way I kind of think about these shows for myself is that I like starting with the live video, but then it can lead me to all kinds of places. Yeah. And I think brands will find the same thing if they do this right. You know what I mean? Yes, and they should be more open to it. I, I mean, I work with some of them, and far more say, ah, "Nah, better not." Yeah. So, and, and they probably should reconsider their positioning, whether they are doing that with a John, a Brand, a Paul, a Thomas, or a David, whoever. Yeah. So, this is something that they can use in so many ways to create. To add on to their own credibility, this right. is an untapped source of value. It's, it's a gold mine, actually, for, for them. And of course, that will diminish over time. There's this law of diminishing returns. If everybody does it, then somebody else, somebody <laughs> needs to think of doing it even better or getting the next stage. But in general, they, they need to really untap that or tap into that value even more. Yeah. And I think the good news is that it's, it's, even though there's a lot of video content out mm-hmm. there, as we discussed earlier in the show, there's not a lot of really good video content out mm-hmm. there. Uh, so I think there are opportunities for, for brands here to be more creative yeah. on this topic and, and all of that AI stuff and bells and whistles, it all fits in and there's no silver bullet, right? Like, like there's no, like, Oh, you know, everyone watches a certain kind of video. I think what you're going to find in in the enterprise slash B2B space is that having a variety of content formats that reinforce your core themes, that have a lot of the ingredients we we picked apart today, 
I think that's really going to work for you. Mm. And yeah. what, what you're going to be really happy about is, is your brand's going to kind of punch above its weight, so to speak, in, in the social domains, because people are going to be drawn to your content who are not mm. drinking your Kool-Aid. And that's, that's ultimately what we want because, you know, the Kool-Aid drinkers, that's like, that's like, you know, that trout farm. Yeah. It's easy fishing for a while, but then if yeah. it doesn't get replenished, there's nothing there anymore. Yeah. And, and what the broader thing is about trust and reaching people who you, you haven't reached in the past. Yeah. And I just really want to encourage brands to take a second look at this because yeah. it's not easy at first, but it gets a lot easier, mm. right? Like, like the first video show or two is hard, but then, <laughs> then you get into a rhythm with yeah. it, right? Yeah. And and it's fun. Yeah, so. and there are two points to it to add on. So one, the rhythm is can't be overemphasized. So right. doing it once or twice yeah. creates noise. However relevant it is that that you produce, if you're doing it only once or twice, you don't really need to do it because it will end up as noise. And, and the other part is the credibility. Don't put your brand up front, but the solution to a problem, which then quite naturally gets associated with your brand because it's coming from you. Right. And after all, your logo is somewhere on the screen, you know, or it's your YouTube channel. So, but don't say it's, it's me. I, my great brand does the, all this and more. Oh, this is the solution, or this is the problem, this is a solution to it. Yep. And provide the thinking around it, the rationale. Don't put the brand up front. The brand will come. Beautiful. That's a perfect note to end on. Thank, thank you, Thomas, for helping me to dissect this, because I really wanted to leave people with, with lessons, and I think we did. Uh, so there's plenty more content thank where you. this came from, so please ping both of us if you want to follow up more. And thanks all for watching and for your terrific questions. Catch you next time. See you. Later. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the next.